AP 120, Chapter 18, Topics, Fluid Compartments and Water Balance. So, balance, of course, is important for the human body, maintaining that appropriate homeostasis, that stable internal environment. And a big part of that is the amounts of fluids and electrolytes. And what we should have is the amount of fluids and electrolytes that leave equal the amount of fluids and electrolytes that are coming in. So out equals in. Um, we know that alternate concentration of electrolytes in the blood will alter the concentration of water and vice versa. So if you have a higher salt concentration, that means you have a lower water concentration. So for instance, if you are at 90% water and then you add a bunch of salt, now it is less than 90% water. because The salt is displacing some of the water and is now being added to the whole. And of course the reverse, if you have 90% water and you add more water, now you've got greater than 90% water. You now have a high photonic situation. Lower salt concentration means there's a higher water concentration. And we of course want the concentration to always equal what is isotonic and best for our cells. And so this is why kidneys are involved in maintaining the appropriate uh, composition of our blood by removing both solutes and water so that in the process the overall concentrations in the blood uh, remain constant. So again water critical component of the human body. Uh, the average adult female is about 52 percent water by weight. Average adult male about 63 percent water by weight. And if we look over time, we see that infants are much higher in the amount of water in them, and then adults dry out a bit, and then, of course, the elderly dry out even more. So water is found in many different compartments, many different somewhat um, separate regions within the body. And water is able to move between those regions, as well as many solutes. And so we need this movement to be regulated. Uh, so some compartments, we've got, of course, intracellular, inside of our cells. We have aqueous solutions. Extracellular, outside of the cells. That would include blood plasma in the bloodstream. And, of course, the fluids surrounding the cells, a thing called interstitial fluids. And then there are transcellular um, extracellular regions. These transcellular regions are uh, slightly more isolated cavities. All right, now what we find is that when we change the composition of the uh, environment in one compartment, it will affect the composition of the fluids in other compartments. So, for instance, we've got the fluid surrounding cells, the interstitial compartment add more water to that. This will cause the concentration of solutes to decrease. There is now a lower concentration of things dissolved in that solution. The cell is now in a hypotonic environment, a hypotonic environment. So what will happen? Well, things will move. So which way will water move in this example? And what will happen to the cells? Well, it turns out Water will move into the cell, causing the cell to swell. The cell may even burst or lice. So again, hypotonic environment for the cell. High concentration water outside, low concentration water inside. Water is going to move into the cell. And we can have the other effect. We could have, say, water loss. So now there's less water in the interstitial uh, uh, fluid in the interstitial compartment. Now we have a higher concentration of solute relative to water. This makes the interstitial fluid hypertonic when compared to the cell. So now which direction will water move? And what happens to the cell? Well, water will move out of the cell, going from the high concentration of water inside the cell to the low concentration of water outside of the cell. This will cause the cell to shrivel, to shrink, and potentially even to die. So changes in one compartment will affect the other compartments. 
changes in the fluid surrounding cells will affect the composition of fluids inside the cell. All right, so the intracellular fluid compartment holds about 63% of our total fluids. So most of our fluids are within cells. And then within the extracellular fluid compartment, we have 37% uh, of total fluids of water and electrolytes that are outside of the cells. And this would include the interstitial fluids, which makes the largest portion of extracellular fluids, the blood plasma, another significant portion, uh, the lymph fluid within the lymphatic system, and those transcellular fluids in those uh, somewhat isolated cavities. So again, 63% of the water and electrolytes are in cells. 37% are in these extracellular fluid compartments. So some examples of transcellular fluid locations. Uh, we've got the cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the brain and spinal cord. You have the fluids within the eyeball itself. Uh, synovial fluids found in the synovial joints. Serous fluids found in the serous membranes, uh, pleural membrane, uh, peritoneum, and the pericardial membrane. And then uh, some extracellular gland secretions. So for instance, say gas, gastric fluids being produced in the stomach. All right, again, what we want is the extracellular fluids and the intracellular fluids to be isotonic. We want the overall concentration, uh, basically the overall amount of water in both compartments to be equal. That doesn't mean that you have the same amount of solutes, though. So different things can be dissolved in these fluids. You just want the overall concentration the same so that water doesn't have a, a reason to move in an unbalanced manner. So, for instance, in extracellular fluids, we see that we have a high amount of sodium ions and a relatively high amount of chloride ions and, and a somewhat high amount of bicarbonate ions. And then in the intracellular fluids, we have a high amount of potassium ions, a relatively high amount of magnesium ions, and a high amount of phosphate ions. So again, even though these are uh, isotonic fluids, the solutes, the things dissolved in them, are different, are distinct. And this is useful, this is important, because we need these uh, uh, ion distributions to allow us to do things like generate nerve impulses, to generate muscular contractions, and other important physiological activities. All right, so... The way fluids can move between compartments include hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the force of the fluid on its surroundings. So blood pressure is the force, the pressure of the fluid, the plasma on the walls of the blood vessels. And as we know, in blood capillaries, this pressure, this hydrostatic pressure, this blood pressure can help to force fluids with solutes to leave the bloodstream and enter the interstitial fluids. And then we also have osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is the um, potential, the force caused from movement of water, of osmosis. Basically, the um, draw of water to a particular compartment because that compartment is hypertonic compared to the compartment the water is in. So for instance, um, if the interstitial fluid has a higher solute amount than the plasma in the blood, then water is going to want to, oh, I said that backwards. So if after you have fluids and some solutes leave and enter the interstitial fluid, now the interstitial fluid is somewhat more dilute, the plasma is more concentrated, so the plasma is hypertonic compared to the interstitial compartment. So water is going to want to move into the blood capillaries. That would be osmotic pressure. And again, all that fluid caused the interstitial compartment to be hypotonic and these other compartments to be hypertonic and allow for water to move into those other compartments. 
Uh, again, composition of fluids varies. It's the total solute concentration that matters. We want isotonic solutions in all these different compartments. And whenever we have a net gain or loss of water, this can cause shifts between these various compartments, cause movement of water from, say, the interstitial fluids to the uh, intracellular fluids or the lymph fluid or the blood plasma. Looking again to reestablish a balance, to return all of the compartments to an isotonic state. So osmotic pressure is looking to turn all of these compartments back to an isotonic state where they all have the same total solute concentration and therefore the same concentration of water. All right, so for instance, we have fluids leaving the plasma in the blood capillaries because of hydrostatic pressure, because of the blood pressure. And then uh, they accumulate in the interstitial fluid and then fluid is going to want to return to the blood capillaries because of uh, osmotic pressure, because we have all this water leaving the blood plasma, it becomes more concentrated and because the blood plasma have all those proteins that aren't going to leave, it causes the blood plasma to be hypertonic, so water and some other materials will return because of the osmotic pressure. And for instance, fluids entering the lymph vessels, again, this is being caused by hydrostatic pressure. As the fluids build up in the tissues, this increases the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial fluid, in the interstitial compartment. And eventually it'll be high enough that it'll force open the lymph capillaries and allow fluids to enter the lymph capillaries. Uh, edema is when you have too much fluid accumulation in your tissues. Um, that's often when the lymphatic system isn't working properly. And this causes swelling in one region or many regions of the body uh, and can cause a lot of health issues. Water balance, we want the intake of water to be the same as the outtake. So we want the amount of water we drink plus the water we get from foods plus water generated from the metabolism to equal uh, the amount of water we are going to lose. And we can regulate how much water we bring in via thirst. And it's the hypothalamus that controls our thirst, our desire for fluids. And it does this by detecting um, fluid composition, fluid volume in various areas, especially in the bloodstream. So it has osmotic receptors detecting the pressure in the bloodstream. And when that gets low, it will um, cause us to feel thirsty and then we will drink fluids. And when the stomach stretches, we will lose that desire to drink more fluids. And of course, water loss comes from urine primarily plus loss through the skin and breathing, plus loss in feces and loss in actual sweat. So even when we are not hot and sweaty, we still lose some water through uh, impersible, insensible sweat, uh, water leaving through the skin. And of course, all of this is controlled by things like the temperature we're uh, in, the relative humidity, whether or not we're physically working out. Water output, again, is controlled through the kidneys, uh, urine production in the distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts. Hormones like antidiuretic hormone will cause us to form more concentrated urine, so less water is lost. But if we have sufficient intake of water, then the ADH will stop being produced and we'll have more dilute urine to get rid of the excess water and decrease overall blood volume. Then we get a lovely equal amount of water intake versus water loss. That is our goal to remain healthy. 